and we're on. Yay! <laughs> we are on. So we have Maria Bogavac here with us. Maria is from Montenegro. She's a fifth year student. She's a senior javelin thrower. Maria, maybe we can hear from you. Talk about a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I'm a fifth year. I'm a grad student. Um, it's my it's my fourth year in UV actually. I, I I came five years ago in US, and it's been it's been a tough time. But I went to Kennesaw State my first year, and I transferred my second year to UVA, uh, and since then I'm here. I'm, I'm stuck here, <laughs> uh, and actually it's been uh, it's been a hell of a ride. So yeah. What uh what are some of your experiences over the four the five years now, right? So how was transition? One of the question is how was transition from high school to college, and being that is high school from Montenegro, not US. It hasn't been really an easy path from like international standpoint, right? So it's uh, we don't know so much about the recruitment recruitment process or actually how everything is going um, as much as American may know, right? So um, I found out that um, if there's a chance that I can go to U.S. and continue my career. There is no such a thing college uh, athletics in, in Europe, right? So it's been tough to decide what to do after high school. Um, should I continue with throwing uh, and then not go to school? Or should I, should I just go to school and not throw? Like, it's been just... That decision has been really tough, um, especially because I, I want to throw, I, I, I love athletics, I love javelin, so it's been really tough. But then um, I found out that there's a way, right? My English was really not that good, <laughs> um, so I couldn't really do SAT nor TOEFL. I did four times SAT, um, two times TOEFL, and um, yeah, I had been studying for two years, and uh, it just it wasn't easy. And I think that even from my standpoint right now, it's still not easy to do SAT. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just did um, the be best of my ability, right? And I um, kind of kind of accepted me with the, those scores, and I kind of like accepted that decision. I worked so hard my first year. I studied really hard. I had like 3.8 GPA, and I just transferred. So it wasn't easy to get to UVA. I mean, it's Many of you may know. Um, it's really hard. Yeah, so it's really hard. And, um, you know, with all the injuries and everything that I had, um, it's been, like, a groundbreaking. What should I do if I, like, I cannot throw? Um, so that was really, like, driving me. What should I do next? Should I throw? Um, or should I just, like, quit? Should I go? There was instances where I was just like, I need to go home. Like, I cannot do this anymore. And that, that really, like, stuck with me since my first year and first since injury. first injury i mean i i was injured when i was home and i kind of recovered my my ucl i i had a partial tear so i kind of recovered right seven months i didn't do so much and there was i didn't do any treatments and stuff so and then i uh, i was like i i need to do something that how it was, will help how me. was mentally the first the first injury that you had uh the first time, because uh, uh, for you guys that don't know, Maria had two surgeries uh, while here. Um, so the first was the elbow. Yeah, so Tommy Jones. Well, a couple um, of times, right? Elbow two yeah. times. But the mm -hmm. second one, it actually broke it. How did that feel? What was the, what was the, your whole uh, thinking through it? Mm, okay, yeah. So it was 2014. Um, it was European Championship in Georgia, Tbilisi. And um, I mean, it was... Um, it was my last chance to actually um, get to World Championship in Eugene, and um, I had the throws um, in warm-up, I had the throws in training, everything was leading to actually me throwing the standard, um, and then first throw, um, I just hear my elbow click, and I, I, I didn't know what to do in that moment, it was just like very painful, very unpleasant, um, like I could hear like my elbow, uh, so I was like, oh, I'm fine, you know, I, I I'm, I just, you know, I was warmed up, I was, you know, it wasn't really something that... You're still on the adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't really quite sure what happened, um, so I was like, I look at my coach and I'm like, it hurts, like, it hurts, um, so he was like, it's fine, it's fine, like, you got this, you know, and I think that, I mean, as many of your coaches, right, and then whoever is listening to this um, or watching... Um, you know, you you have to listen to your body. You have to think what your body actually needs in that moment and how does it feel. I mean, in that moment, I was really young. I had no idea what to do and what happened. Um, 
So I, I listened to my coach as always, right? So I continued throwing, and of course, I mean, every throw was just like, I, uh, worse and worse, right? I mean, elbow is really complicated, um, but in that sense, like, it, I knew something was wrong. Um, so, yeah, leading to that, like, I, I threw very poorly, right? I couldn't even focus on throwing. And, yeah, so seven months doing nothing, uh, no treatment. I didn't even do MRI or anything. So it was quite an adventure um, where, yeah, it was a partial tear. Um, later on, I um, start training again. I start strengthening my elbow. Um, and I threw like 52 meters again after that. Um, and then I came to US, I threw my PR 54. So I, all of that I was throwing with that partial tear and with that pain. And, and then it, it happened in the regionals in Jacksonville 2016, where I actually um, partial tore my, um, it's, it's my, it's my, it was my ankle, right? Um, so I was jumping and it was, it was crazy. and. My whole foot, I couldn't walk for a couple of months. So um, my second coach right there, he, he made me also throw a day before competition, and um, that's when I tore completely my UCL. So it's um, it's crazy. But then, you know, again, from my standpoint right now, I think it's, it's important to address that you have to listen to your body and you have to address these concerns that you have in order to actually help yourself. Yeah. So many athletes definitely, this is, this is a horrifying story that I'm listening from you. I listen to it. I heard it many times already, but it's really, really hard not to listen to your coach. Uh, but it's very important to listen to your body. Like you said, it's really important to listen to that. Um, but, but when you're pushed into that situation, so many athletes like yourself, uh, you have no other choice, right? You think that you're doing the right thing. Coach tells you like, oh, you're fine, like you said. Uh, and that how, obviously physically that was horrible. Mentally, how that feel when you knew that you did what you were supposed to, but you still got hurt? Mm -hmm. I, I did everything right. Like, um, I, I trained hard. I, I threw... Every day, I, I, I didn't know better, right? Um, and, and as you said, like, for me, the coach is the sacredest person ever in the world, right? So whatever coach says, I have to do that. Um, so it was like a father figure for me in the sense where, you know, he knows the best, he knows what I need, and um, that's how I should do it. You know, on the other side, I mean, you, you, you're right. Like, I don't know how to say no. I don't know how to say, yeah, no, you're wrong, or really hurts it really hurts i cannot do this anymore and, and i'm really a perfectionist i i really need to do these things perfectly so i can know i did something right um and if i do something partially then it's not done so you know but it's like five years ago i'm t i'm totally different person right now where it's it's crazy for me right now but i mean then i just what would you do differently Probably I didn't. I wouldn't throw every day. <laughs> uh, I mean, right now we're throwing twice a week, and it's just like, oh my god, that's great. Then I was throwing every single day, and it was really hard throwing. And we would not. We would do just some jumps or maybe some running. I mean, I know that maybe high schoolers don't have the capacity to do these things like a college facility, like college facilities or or training. But I would say that regarding javelin, right? That's what you're talking. But um. It's really a complicated event, and it, it takes a lot on your body. And um, I would say that twice a week is definitely like th three yeah. times a week. I mean, like twice a week is enough for for improvement, right? What are some so obstacles when you're coming? Obviously, SAT. It's really so for all the foreigner foreigners out there. You say you, it took you two years to get prepared for SAT? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you study? What did you, well, there's some resources that you use, the book, SAT book? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So, I mean, nowadays you have everything online. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking like I'm so old, right? <laughs> but, uh, Pre internet age. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I wasn't aware of these things I have um, out there to help me prepare for this. So I actually had a friend who trained with me, and she was a year older than me. So she actually had a book that um, she borrowed from some um, friend from Serbia, and then we kind of got that book together, and I copied the whole book and um, and everything. So I, I studied from that, right? Um, same thing for TOEFL, um, I would say. So there was 
it was it was exhausting for me because I was like I don't know anything of this you know and math was kind of easier because that's what we studied in high school but English was really hard um, really hard the words I've never I'm, I don't even know right now if I if I would know those you words. Never use it in college either, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I prepare for my GRE now, and I, the same thing, right? So, but definitely reach out to those people who actually can help you and your friends. And um, I mean, there are so many resources online right now that can you know help video practice um, um, online practice exams, um, or maybe just like classes, take classes um, if you can afford it. Um, but um, it's definitely time consuming and it takes a lot of time especially for I mean foreigners maybe that don't know English that well it's 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 hard I'm impressed by all of you guys uh, that our foreigners who speak obviously native language is different than English right you have to learn English to be able to take SAT right it's past the TOEFL and that's just the minimum and then you have to go to class, classes how was that first year one thing is taking a test first couple of years of college when you actually had to sit down and read and learn in English. How was that? I was translating everything. <laughs> I was literally translating everything my first semester. Um, uh, my roommate was from Czech Republic and um, uh, her and I, we kind of, we were in the same boat. Um, we both spoke some English, like it was, it was interesting. Czech and, and Serb, Serbo-Croatian are kind of, kind of similar, right? So we kind of communicate more in that than in English. But then by the time, like we actually had to practice English, we practiced with each other, which really helped me a lot. So then when I would come to classroom, I would not be thinking, oh my God, I need to translate this into this and then say something like contribution to class, right? But then as the time was passing by, I would just, force myself literally I need to write every single word that professor says and then learn like read everything later um, so I studied like twice as hard as anyone else probably that first couple of months I mean Georgia like southern accent is kind of like hard I, I I really couldn't quite understand anything like what I said um, so I was like coach what did you say like I have no idea like he had to repeat like like was, there, was there a moment in the classroom or oh, yeah. a practice that you were like, this is... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just stared at them. Like, it was really like, <laughs> what, else, like what else can I do? Yeah, um, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, but I was, I, I think it had to help me because it's way differently than, than Virginia, right? I, all parts of the U.S., are so vastly different um, in different cultures and accents and I mean I have an accent I mean but in the same time you can you learn those things like you know y'all or I mean that, those <laughs> like those things that I will never learn in, in books right um, but then in classroom like by the time it was passing by I kind of got used to it and um, I don't think I will ever forget this but I the first time I dreamt in English that was like revelation I was like <sighs> I'm so good right now, um, ta-da, um, and it was amazing. I, I, don't, I think my brain, you know, my nerve cells and, and everything, it was, it was something very special for me that um, this is the first time I was dreaming something in a different language or it's a different experience for sure. Um, and then I would find out that in Spanish and if, I mean, it, later on as I would progress my languages. But, but it, it's, it's definitely, uh, and it's weird. I don't, I don't know how to explain that, right? Uh, but yeah, that first semester was really hard, and then yeah, I worked just twice as hard as any 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 other person, and like you know, I didn't have any life. I just I know what I want. I didn't want to stay there. I want to transfer, so I really I knew I have to work hard so I can get to UVA. Otherwise, I would just you know stay there, and that was not an option for me, right? I, I had to get what I want, and that's the only way out. You had a goal. Yeah, I remember talking to Maria. Her senior year in high school uh, she was very smart great grades but for UVA SAT and TOEFL are very very important and your, I remember your uh, TOEFL score was not as high as we <laughs> as we would be able to accept and that's why we couldn't uh, I was uh, I was sad but then I had to tell you that we, we, we can't um, we can't accept you but I'm very happy that you continued on your pursuit, that you went to U.S., that you had found a school, that you did really well at that school for them, and that you did reach out for us. Obviously, Maria now is a very accomplished javelin thrower after all the surgeries now that we had. 
what I, what do you expect now your this year from from yourself in terms of uh, athletics? To graduate and also to graduate in javelin. I mean, I I, I kind of hate the question. What are your five, ten year goals? And I I am kind of like detail oriented person, so I really put myself in like hundred percent in everything I do. So this year. We really worked hard since June, since I had a shoulder surgery. You know, I stayed here the whole summer. I did four classes. That was kind of exhausting. And you didn't, um, go, you didn't go home for a while. No, yeah, I wasn't home for a year and a half, and then I went now for winter break. So, so I, I yeah, I stayed here the whole summer, doing rehab every single day, again and again. After yeah, my elbow, yeah. I did two years, and now, so. You know, I had something set up in my mind that I'm like, this is, you know this, like, you, you, this happened already. You don't have to be, you know, as as before, I would be like, you know, oh boy, it was really two years, almost two years it took me to completely recover from elbow surgery. Since it was such a, I, I tore my UCL completely and it was just partial tear, tear and healed and not healed. So it was, it was a mess. But shoulder was really really not that bad uh, I would say it took me f- six months to recover um, and I just worked hard and every day you know you gotta do rehab you gotta do all these things you gotta sleep well and then when we ca- when you guys came back I was waiting for you <laughs> and um, you here by, by yourself and the by whole summer, summer. Yeah. yeah and then we just start working mm-hmm. we just uh, did training by training my shoulder still really didn't feel that well to throw and so we kind of start with pushing a little bit more in conditioning, coordination exercises. I mean, all these kind of things that doesn't include my shoulder as much. We did a lot of medicine ball throws um, to strengthen my shoulder. To get that range of motion, it was really, really hard. It was really tricky because um, I was supposed to get even more range of motion since my surgery was because of that, right? So I can get that range of motion. I don't feel stuck as my shoulder would not allow me to, right? And then... Somewhere in October, I would say that I really started to get that freedom where I would throw a javelin and coach was like, don't feel like, you know, you're scared. And I was really scared. You know, I was scared for my elbow. I was scared for my shoulder before. And now I'm just like, should I trust my shoulder again? And that really caused me to trust myself, to mentally push myself to the limits. And, you know, leaving javelin behind. I mean, wow, that's such an easy thing to say. For somebody who's healthy. Who's healthy. It's so easy, like push javelin back and just relax. Um, yeah, I couldn't relax. So we had a throwing session before I actually went for winter break home. And coach was like, this is great. This is great. And that's actually the first time in December since June, I mean June, since... 2018. Yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> Where I... I was like, this is, I'm relaxed. This is great. Um, so it took me, it took me a while. It took, uh, I think any surgery, as as much as surgeries are, you know, not that great, um, it takes time to actually trust your body again in such a complicated um, joint and muscle, like such as shoulder, right? For javelin, it's kind of like, they, it's important, right? Um, so... Um, so yeah, I really, I was really happy. I went to winter break. Uh, I trained hard back home, and we came back and we just pushed it even more. So, yeah. yeah. What what Maria was just saying? It's so hard to feel to trust your body again after not one surgery but two surgeries. Right? It took you. I remember that in December there was one practice. So after the whole whole fall, that you were able actually to relax, to leave the javelin behind, like I just said. And just to whip it, right? You also changed the grip a little bit. The, we were playing playing around with that, and uh, now it's finally everything's coming together. And I, Maria is modest here. She really uh, talking about working hard. Um, that summer that you had, you had one su- summer was a surgery. One summer you had a car accident. Before that you had an elbow surgery. I mean, oh my God, right? Every every year it was something. And you to come back. This is the first time after a while. You're actually throwing without pain and smooth. What are some things technically that you are that you're working on right now that we are yeah. working on? Yeah, we are working oh, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are working on many things, and I know a coach um, really try, like he wants me to focus on 
two things. But then once we come to practice, I'm like, okay, I want to focus on uh, driving my knee or, um, you know, being closed. My hips need to be more closed and I can get that better, like, left arm stretch. But then I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't think my right uh, leg is giving me that, you know, I'm, I'm open. I'm really open with my hips and I really should, go. and then everything is like, okay, why we just don't focus on one thing? But it's really hard. Yeah, right now we are trying to um, work on my runaway and, and, and the speed uh, and the approach. Because I think that's what makes me feel really confident with throwing. If I feel I am running down the runaway and so smoothly and, you know, I have like that, 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 like I have that um, rhythm and, and I come where I need to be. I don't care about pain. I don't care about anything else. I know everything is going to be okay and I can just throw. But then when I'm like chopping, chopping and I don't feel like this doesn't feel really right. I, you know, I drop my elbow. I don't do a good stretch. I don't do anything right. So first initiative steps are so important for me. You know, I don't have to rush down the runaway. I can, I can take everything step by step. And I can do those things once I'm relaxed and confident in my shoulder and my arm. So maybe like now we, you know, tomorrow we are throwing and I really want us to focus on, you know, being more closed and, and that, that right leg being more closed um, so I can get that stretch in my left arm, which is, which is something that I found out this year. I'm really working well on that and um, I can see on my throwing how that um, now, the is The last thing yeah. was incredible. Just for you guys, I'll put this on online as well. Or on YouTube, this video of Maria throwing and, and send me that video <laughs> again. <laughs> there was one particular throw that she really pulled the javelin, uh, pulled a uh, stretch across the chest with the left arm. Your javelin was straight, it didn't go up. You were smooth on the runway, and it was so easy. It was it was really far, and you didn't even try. Uh, you just got the timing right. Block was okay. It could be better, but like like you said, it's really hard to focus on uh, not to focus on so many things when there's so many things to work on and you really had a really really good throw i'm excited that you were indoor we had a little breakthrough throwing in the net same thing we had in the cage a year ago difference between this year and last year um, just from a coaching perspective is that maria now is healthy she had like we talked about the surgery of the shoulder you had a little breakthrough in a cage when you threw to the net remember that, that session really good i'll try to find that as well and now, finally, you are throwing that not just inside, but outside as well. So um, we'll continue to uh, keep you guys updated. We'll, uh, ho hopefully, we'll have another podcast, but we'll take the videos online. But right now, this is actually, I will say this is your actually second year of throwing. Yeah. What you had before is so many injuries, so many bad habits. And now you're actually healthy, and now you're training like a normal gel and thrower. I'm a sophomore. Yes, <laughs> yes. How many you... Uh, you, you know this, uh, you told me this, that down in South Africa, Germans were throwing was it, every other day. or yeah, So you, when you have somebody like Vetter or uh, Roller, right, when they can throw six, seven years without major injuries, so you can throw once a week, twice a week, that's in, that is so much more powerful than being a great athlete overall, right? Because so, you have so much time to train, and now you're finally training. So I wish this happened before or injuries happened when you were 14 that you it healed you up. Uh, but I do, I hope to see you throw not just this year, but hopefully next year. That's my plan. <laughs> you are a UVA graduate student, soon to be a student with a master's degree, and you're an athlete. How do you manage your time? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm sure that many of Athlete, I mean, every athlete, right, on the collegiate level struggle with time management. And um, we are kind of like a doctorate. In, we, we have a doctorate, <laughs> right, in time management. And it's really hard. Uh, someone who, this is a, I have a clear goal, right? And if you really want to achieve something, that you will do whatever it takes. Um, so this is a really, it's not for everyone. I would say I, I kind of like, I see that with the people who are coming, I mean, I'm really old right now, but um, I see the people who are coming uh, last year and this year, they're struggling. And I wish 
I wish, you know, I, I give some tips, right? So it's kind of easier, but it's your mentality. It's, it's how you perceive college. It's how you perceive your goals, um, your sport, not just athletics, right? But I would say I, I'm working. We have twice a day training um, for almost every day. And then, um, you know, I have classes um, and then rehab and then, I mean, everything. And then how, and I, I love to sleep nine hours a day, 10 hours if that's possible. So that's something like if I can, if I sleep like seven hours, I cannot function the next day. So how to... You have 24 hours, right? And how you, I need more hours. I always say that when I have practice, I always say, Coach, I just need more hours in a day. A couple more hours in a um, day. Yeah. So, I mean, I can say my daily routine. What's your, yeah, what's yeah. Your, that's my question. What is your day like? Your busiest day, how, when you get up, and yeah. food, uh, sleep, everything. I get up every day at seven. That's the earliest I can wake up, seriously. And first thing, you know, I need breakfast. I cannot leave my house without it. You know, coffee, Turkish coffee. Yeah. And, you know, shower, get ready, go training at nine. You know, finish training. I have class at 11. So it's just rushing to get to class and not be late. You know, from 11 to two classes, lunch, box to go, um, pretty much. Where do you get your lunch? Um, usually I get on campus, right? On campus, we have cafeterias, dining halls, food trucks. Um, you know, I sometimes I go to um, to take food um, from a restaurant. It depends what's my mood that day. But yeah, and then I go to work a little bit. I have I have to work and training again. So you know, from two to five, I have work, and then from five to six thirty, we have. Um, lifting practice and then I have to see chiropractic at 6 30 or have a massage at 6 30 until like 7 7 30 um go home 8 8 30 eat dinner shower and um study until 10 so yeah that's incredible I talked to Ryan the last time about the same things right you guys go through so much and it's incredible that you can do that was there a point that that you were all overwhelmed? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, I w sometimes I would give hundred euros for uh, a nap. <laughs> I, I mean, there was actually there's no money that I can, um, you know, get a nap in. Yeah, it, I'm when I'm really sleepy, I get. I don't know. I get crazy. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not in a good mood. I, I argue with people. And I mean, it's not who I am, but You're it's human. just, yeah. Right? And I'm just really tired. Like today I had a debate for one hour and a half in my class. And um, yeah, it's it's exhausting, right? So How do you deal with that? How do, when you're overwhelmed, what do you do to keep you on your goal? Hmm. Yes. So it depends. Sometimes you have different types of overwhelmness, right? And Sometimes I'm more overwhelmed with my class homework, um, my it, school in general. I have so, yeah, and sometimes I'm overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, throwing is not going well. Um, I'm not lifting well. My body just feels like I'm shutting down. So those are all types of stress. And um, you, you got to know kind of like what is working for you. For me, naps right i love to sleep and um, that kind of brings me back to normal or going for a dinner with my friends and speaking just uh, english is kind of hard so it, it's time consuming and it's energy consuming and it's everything so you know speaking my language uh, kind of helps me bring down um the atmosphere and the and uh, yeah so Thank God we have, I mean, many international students who speak the same language as us. So, you know, hanging out with them kind of helps as well. But, you know, watching a TV, TV show, like watching something that calms you down or, I don't know, reading a book that really like, it's it's some, some stuff that you know yourself and you know what you need. Even though you have a gazillion things going on and, you know, you don't really have to just, it's like, it's fine. It's okay. Like... It's just, you know, you have one life, you should enjoy it. But in the sense where 
I need this because I cannot do other things if I don't do this first. Um, so, you know, when I'm eating, I cannot study. Like, I just need TV show and my breakfast or my lunch or whatever. So that's just me time. You know, I was joking with my family when I was back home and I was like, I just need me time. Like, don't bother me. I, you know, it's... I need to, I need this. And they're like, like meditation, yeah. yeah, you need your, yeah, your space. Yeah. And that really helps me. So I think that most of the people like do some different things or the other, but, um, it depends. Finding, finding what you're saying is find your, what works for you to get that relaxing time, whether it's watching TV or eating or meditating or going for a walk. So finding that it's very important. That is, we will have, I had a couple of athletes and you can see this during the, midterms and finals you guys push yourself really to the limit and i had athletes who wouldn't sleep just so they can study and that that can hurt you a lot so you have to be smart and you're doing a great job at this maria obviously you're doing well in school you're doing well uh, in track you have to find that balance you have to sacrifice sacrifice some things sometimes i mean it's a joke right but we don't have life i mean it's just there was a professor a couple of days ago and we like they're like oh so what do you do for spring break <laughs> and i'm like um training, uh, yeah like training and sleeping and and they're like you're cut you're kidding right i'm like no that's just my life seriously but um you know they don't know they professors are really good here at uva um showing that level of support but sometimes they cannot possibly know what we are going through that day or if we done some assignment on time or we have a traveling that we can and we cannot attend a midterm or something so it's really beneficial for any athlete that um comes in the beginning of semester and speaks with the professor and say hey i'm an athlete i do this this and this you know you might be you know i want you to be aware of this and i might be gone for some yeah so you know just so you can give like a heads up and so we don't have problems later and you know that kind of like also is stuck writing a midterm on the bus or like homework on the like it's it's also draining you kind of like you are tired you just finished your meet and you gotta study and so preparing ahead of time i know it's tough but it's crucial um then you can really focus and be calmed during the meet and after and then you can come planning out everything yeah correctly what time for what things right this is the time for sleep. This is the time for study. This is the time for training. Uh, this is time to talk to a professor. Tell him like I need I need a couple more days. <laughs> Maybe uh, what in UVA? What do you think? What, what what are some special things about UVA that you think that helps you become the person that you are now? Obviously, some obstacles, some great things, some connections, whatever it is. Uh, what's what did you find in UVA that's you're gonna cherish that you yeah. that you have been here? Well, uh, many things, right? I would say as an international first, yeah, speaking with the professor, really, like even going to office hours, I mean, I know it's a, like, a cliche, but I really cherished that relationship I had with my professors where, you know, I, d I have no problem going to them and saying, hey, this is a situation I'm in. I don't really quite understand what what happened in this lecture. Did you find them helpful? Oh yeah, and they they are so like they're amazed because they don't really experience that very often. People don't go to office hours. People just like you know they write their notes and study for midterms. But um, for me, first couple of years, I really did this every single day. After the lecture, I was like, "Do you have some ten minutes of your time to speak with you?" Because sometimes I wouldn't catch what they were saying, and I really don't understand how can I learn this if I I don't understand what you're saying. And it wasn't Englished as much as the culture of UVA. It's This is a highly educated <laughs> institution um, where everybody is expected to be on top of their um, game, right? So very smart people, very educated, you know, and I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. Like, you know? uh, And sometimes it's just like going around and I'm like, okay, can you repeat that? I need, but, a, I need a clearance. Yeah. yeah. I need to clear this up. Um, but then I'm thinking, you know, I just became like that. And it's kind of funny because I always say you are who you're with. Yeah. And your surrounding makes you who you are. Um, you know, the people you hang out, people you know, people you talk to, you know, either your athletes or coaches or professors. And I love that. I want this forever, right, to stay with me. Um, 
in terms of I don't have to be scared of asking for help, but also clarification on some things. So I can actually learn. Like, you know, you always learn. I mean, yes. always, like when you're alive. But that culture at UVA really helped me to perform the way I perform. And I have um, gained so much respect for the professors, but also for the UVA in general. So I think um, it's hard to explain this maybe to somebody who grew up in the U.S., where Maria is from and where I'm from, if you ask professor anything, it, it means that you don't know and then you're not expect, you're not allowed almost sometimes to ask questions to people, to uh, your superiors, right? So you have this kind of uh, uh, inferior complex, at, at least I did, I know a lot, of, a lot of students from Europe, that you're afraid to talk to professor. And here, what I found out also at UVA when I was in school, not that, there's, not that they are just willing to help you but they are very happy when you come to ask them and it's an incredible incredible tool to office hours to ask professor so this is professor who's gonna give you the test right yeah. and you come to him and he's gonna what he's not gonna tell you he's gonna tell you what actually what's gonna be on the test eventually right so you're numb you're missing opportunity to get explanation to get clear answers on what's gonna be on the test and for us international students it's really, like I said, it's almost where we grew up, it's almost um, um, that you are offending a professor if you come and ask. And what I found out here, too, they're not just willing to help you, but they're happy to help you. And they're, they're, they're so uh, involved in your, they want you to learn, right? I mean, that's the goal, yeah. <laughs> right? What I found out when I came here was really impressive that after every semester, you have to grade. Uh, the professor and his teaching and I'm like this is wow what I get to give him grades <laughs> or her that's something we, we didn't have back home so it's it's amazing that actually they they get that feedback and they read it and it's so beneficial for them but also for the superiors because if they do well uh, you know they get to stay where where they are and they get to keep their job but at the same time they get to be, hey, I really do this well, and this is maybe something I should improve on. So it's not just students are improving by you know talking to professors, but also professors talking to students and getting that feedback from them. Because teaching is such a, I mean, it's not for everyone, I would say. Um, and that's what I really like about uh, this institution. So. No, you're right. Uh, same as coaching. Some uh, I say this all the time. Some people are not meant to be coaches, not meant to be professors or teachers, right? Some people just cannot get that perception that how to uh, mold their thoughts or mold their, uh, mold their directions to athletes or students so they can understand it better, right? So if you get a uh, feedback, and what I, what I like from you guys always, I tell you this a lot, what do you, how did you feel that throw? What, what do you feel? What are you thinking about right now? Because right? I need that feedback so we can work better together. Same as professor, right? He's going to learn how to teach better and you're going to be better at it as well. So um, it, it's a win-win. And I, I'm so, I'm, I'm grateful for education that we had back, back in Croatia, back in Serbia and back in Montenegro, right? It's, it's a same system. But I, I wish we had what, what we have here is the feedback from professors asking professors um because that will make everybody so much so much better yeah um so we're gonna see if we have we have some we have a lot of questions uh, from the audience um one was what is your pre-meet routine okay <laughs> i've been doing this since i know i started doing track i would say I think that's, first, I love to sleep well. I mean, that's something really crucial for, um, not just for the day of the meet, but every day, right? And I would say that you you just come to compete, but you just, you do everything else before that brings you that medal and not actually, oh, I'm going to go to a meet and I'm going to win because I did this this day. No, you do everything before and then you just come to win on the meet. Like, you know, you, it, yeah, I mean, I, I would say like the, everything I'm doing right now will get me that medal, will get me that position where I want to be and not, I'm going to come to a meet with amazing daily routine and I'll be, I'll be great, right? Something that I, I, 
I kind of saw a lot in um, in here. So I was like, no, that's not how that works. Yeah, you might have a great day, which is amazing. It's it's partially lucky, like you know, you have to be lucky that day, no wind or yeah. you know those kind of things. But yeah, I like I like to sleep well, wake up really in a good mood, eat good food, you know, and then I come two hours, three hours before the, the, the competition, and um, I know this is a really not good advice, and you shouldn't do this. But I always have Red Bull with me, um, and I always have uh, raisins or Snickers. So I like sweet. And yeah, so I really, I always say to my, to my coach that I bring Kinder, wear no chocolate, like whatever. And I, I eat in the middle of practice. Like I, <laughs> I'm hungry sometimes and uh, well, most of the time. Um, but I love to eat sweet and um, I'm really taking care how much I eat sweet, but Sometimes I said my sugar is very low, like my blood sugar is so I cannot function. So that actually kind of helps me um, prepare for, you know, I have that Red Bull, I have that Snickers or raisins. It's a lot of sugar. So I don't know, you shouldn't listen to me. But yeah, and I, I warm up like 45 minutes to one hour. You know, I do all these things that normally you, you should do. So what I really like what you said about well, basically, your pre-meet is a year before, right? So if you're not ready, if you haven't done what you needed to do for that year, for those two years before, when the meet comes, basically, there's nothing that's going to help you, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, it's kind of, you shouldn't probably, like, squat heavily the day before, or you shouldn't probably do these crazy things. Yeah. You should do tunis, which is right normal, but... You know, we are lifting so heavy right now so we can prepare for the season. So all the things that we do in the winter preparation, it's that's it, right? Throwing is a little bit different because we can push throwing. We can, you know, I'm throwing like 60, 70% right now. And uh, there is no need for me to throw 100 because my shoulder is not ready or I don't have to. But my body needs to adapt to the conditions, to my block, to heavy block, to my speed. You know, and all these all these things that helps you to throw better, right? So we we do gymnastics, we do jumps, triple jump, long jump. We do all these things that you know you shouldn't really. You we don't do this in in, in the season as much, right? Um, we do very very low intensity and and high rep, like so. It's a, it's it's different, right? Like you do all this in winter preparation, and you just come and you win medal as long as you do it right, but. Um, I don't know. I, I never saw anyone who just comes and win yeah, and without, do nothing. Without work. Yeah. No, it's it, we, uh, athletes in the past that haven't been as obviously. You, know, you guys cannot see that, but hopefully you'll see over time uh, as we introduce athletes here. But Maria is very, very thorough in her or her training and her rehab, studying always. She wouldn't be at this point if you, you, know, you would not be here if you. Uh, if you didn't do all that, right? We had I had some incredible talented athletes, and it's it's for a coach it's really hard and really sad to see talent wasted. If you're not sleeping well, if you're if you're staying up hanging out with your friends, God forbid, getting in trouble, right? And then you have to wake up early for a class. You're not ready for that, and that just continues, right? Your habits, your habits make you. So if you're not in the habit to do all the right things, to sleep well, eat well recover do, do your treatment for the whole year there will not be there's no magic bullet that's going to help you uh, or, or magic exercise or pre-meet uh, routine that's going to help you to throw far because you're not in that shape uh, even worse if you're not doing all these things you're getting in a worse shape you're, you're degrading your body you're hurting your body you're not sleeping enough stress levels are going up your your body cannot recover on time meaning that you're that your tendons are getting weaker, your, your injuries are building up, and you're just going to dissolve. Uh, I, I've seen so many athletes, very talented, not being not being very smart with their time, who they hang out with. Like you said, you are who you're out with, right? And you are what you do. You're, you are your habits and what you do every day. And if you come to the meet, then there's a couple of things that you can do, right? Yeah. You can you know, relax, come eat. Maria eats more candy than a kindergarten, the whole kindergarten during the uh, day before the meet and at the meet. 
but that works for you, right? So you got to find what works for you. But the, if you have, if you didn't come ready, there was nothing, nothing that will help you. Yeah, I would, I would say that I'm really trying hard to eat healthy, and it's really hard in U.S. I, I, I don't know. It's just. Yeah, talk to us about that. Uh, I don't say I would not say anything that it's not true, but. When I got here, I was shocked by the way that it's it's crazy how much food is wasted, how much food is being produced and not spent. I mean, I'm in politics right now, and I'm like, you know, and, and studying about it and, and humanitarian side and point of the view, and people are dying, and you you're throwing so much food. You know, Americans eat like five kilograms of food per day. That's insane. Insane. And I'm really, you know, I, I was really stressing the need of eating healthy. And um, this year, actually, since the summer, I I, d- I decided myself that I'm not going to eat at cafeteria. So I did not take a plan to go and swipe my meals and stuff. I, w- I was doing all these years because, I, 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 you know, my body is changing so rapidly and my, my muscles are contracting when I'm not drinking enough food, you know, I receive like, I, I can see the difference. Like, and your performance food, in the way through yeah, and, uh, food and, and drinks actually make on my body. So I make my own food. I became an excellent chef, okay. which is also a plus, right? You gotta like know how to prepare food. Um, so I made myself YouTube, like, you know, I, I Google everything. Yeah. <laughs> I like, asked Siri, what is this? But, you know, I try to eat at least once a once a week, you know, steak, salmon or, um, you know, chicken um, and then a lot of salad, a lot of, uh, yeah, very, very diversified and unhealthy food, which is really expensive for no reason here. So, yeah, I, I spend a lot of money on that, but I really don't care because I spend money on that food that will help me perform better. So I don't have to spend spend money on the clothes, which I do, but it's okay. I I like that. But in the same time, I investing I, I in want yourself. It. It's it's investing in yourself, which actually prepares you for something much greater, and it, it will come back. It's a win win, as you said, right? So if you're not gonna make a mistake if you invest in yourself in any means, uh, either learning another language or you know eating well, training hard, um, jogging. I mean, anything that you do helps your body um, you may live longer you may perform better so it's it's definitely you know so many benefits so yeah. many benefits yeah there's no there's no better investment than investment in yourself in your body health your health of your body and your mind right so in education learning and investing in your sleep and food stress levels that's I mean that's the point of life is living to the fullest right and if you're not doing that, it will catch up sooner or later, usually sooner than, than you want, want it to catch up. And you will be, you will regret it. And, but there's no coming back from that, right? Uh, uh, again, I'll come back because this, this point, it frustrates me as a coach so much when I see so many talents not doing those steps that, that are needed to be healthy, to be mentally prepared, to, to even, Managing your stress, right? You talked about that. You need your time. Uh, you need to, you know, watch watch a show, whatever it is. Uh, eat by yourself, right? Uh, whatever that is that reduces stress. I hate when I see, and I, it's not. A, I haven't been there. I haven't been young, right? I did mistakes in, in my life. Uh, it hurts me to see that stretch management goes to even more stretch uh, stress, right? So you go out with your friends. You get whatever wasted. You don't sleep. That's so much more stress on your body, and you continue that week over week over week, it just explodes. It has to explode at some point. So it's so I can't stress enough how important it is to to make that plan. Um, did you right from the first year? Uh, did you know how uh, to do that, or was it something that you had in high school? Some habits that you developed. So I've been traveling since I was fourteen, fifteen, would say. So. We have, I mean, uh, Europeans would, you know, we, we have been like, a, I mean, we haven't been professional, but like we had clubs and we traveled to, I mean, I was at the World Championship in Ukraine and European Championship. You travel all year long and you kind of depend on yourself. And 
there, you, your mom is not there to help you. Your, your mom is not there to clean after you. you. You really don't expect from anyone to clean after you. So it's not just like, oh, I'm going to put this glass here and my mom will pick it up. It's just, I need to do all these steps. I need to do this. And actually, I mean, make a planner, make anything that helps you not forget. I'm a forgettable person, so I have everything written down. But in the same time, that kind of helped me prepare when I got Kennesaw ride, like I was on my own, I was like, this is crazy. And my coach, no one really was not there for me. And I was like, I'm by myself. I'm alone. So that kind of like you're stuck, like you, you cannot do anything about it. It forced you to actually adult, like to grow up. And it's, as you said, it makes me sad that some people who are also internationals, like, you know, they expect these things to happen just like that. And in, in the reality, it's it's much harder than it seems. Um, of course, I wasn't perfect or anything, but um, it kind of made me who I am right now, today, right? So, you know, we all make mistakes. We all do some things. But at the end, like, you actually grow. You, you know, I always think I'm like 35 years old. But, you know, I, I act like I'm a grandma. It's fine. I'm 35, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's like I, I feel so much older than I am, and uh, maybe those situations, like you know, those two surgeries or mental breakdowns, maybe that you know I had, and I was like, I'm gonna go home. I cannot do this anymore. And then I'm like, you got this. Like you have to do this. So it, it, you know, eventually helps to grow. Yeah, you were you were put in position to mature early to be self efficient, right? Uh, take care of yourself very early at an early age and you have no choice basically right so what's what's the alternative you're not going to take care of yourself you're not going to pay attention when you're going to get to the bus or what you got to what you're going to eat uh when you're going to eat right you you're a throwing and what i think it's important to know from the early as early as you can right some things are not meant to deal with until you uh, reach certain age right you, you should not cook for yourself if you're nine years old right there's you know, should be somebody there who's taking care of you. And when you get to that teenage years, 15, 16, 17, right? 16, you already get to drive your car. So there are certain ages that you are expected and there's a reason for it why you are, when you're 16, you are allowed to drive your car here in the U.S. In, in back in Europe, it's 18. So there's these, these certain ages that the society expects you to be at this certain level, right? If you're not then you better catch up, right? And if you're ahead of the time, amazing. You'll have such an yeah. easier time. Yeah, I, I am always for that. You know, it's it's kind of hard not to deal with that. But once you're in this situation where you literally have no other choice, it's good that you know what you need to do, you know, and not push the limits like some other people do. And find a balance. Um, I, I would say that that's important so we'll take a little break and then we're going to come back with some more questions all right talk to us Maria, a little bit about why javelin and why not tennis or any other sport that makes money <laughs> tennis is expensive <laughs> um it's really expensive and uh, we actually didn't have tennis back home yeah it's i mean it's really expensive to make tennis tennis courts or you know you have to pay by yourself to to go to the competitions and training camps and you ha it's really really expensive some people may not know it but it's thousands of dollars just to for one competition but we didn't have that and coaches and rackets and times oh, yeah. on the courts it's time i mean it's, it's it's really expensive yeah but for Athletics, I mean, it's something that is really popular back home. Um, you know, handball, soccer, athletics. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, you know, as, as I said before, it's different. We have clubs, we don't have high school, uh, we don't have college, um, you know, sports. So it's really separated. So my coach was um, a PE teacher in high school. And he actually found this club um, for just throwers. So he had a couple of throwers, his uh, his sons, and um, 
they kind of started all this and he was like a recruit like a recruitment process where he was like going to in high school, school in oh, school yeah. so he was just he was just you know he was a PE teacher so he knew who is athletic and who is not so he really had an eye for catching talents and um, just bringing them and hey let's throw a shot foot but my uh, my cousin he was actually a decathlete athlete in that club he, he's a little bit older than me so I was like 12 and I was really tiny, really tiny, and um, I'm not right like right now. But uh, and they still picture for throwing. So no, he actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of a long story, but I'll, I'll shorten up. So my cousin was like, "Why just you, you don't come and we can try something?" Yeah. So I actually did everything. I was a true heptathlete, like and. Even though I never competed in it, but um, first I did long jump. I ran. I was really fast, really small and really fast. So I did that, and then the first throwing event was shot put. So 3K was so hard for me. It was super heavy. We all started with that. So it was a couple of girls and a couple of guys, and um, we just started throwing. It was just throwing events, right? So we had to throw something, and then I threw shot put. I threw hammer, I threw discus a little bit. And then javelin was like really accidental because we didn't have a javelin, okay. like a javelin. Yeah. Um, so he kind of ordered it. It was Polanic for training, like 40 meters. Yeah. <laughs> super stiff, super hard to throw. And um, yeah, I tried it and kind of like just flew. So he was like, okay, like that's let's try event. to, yeah, that's your event. That's how you decide to do that. And since then, I mean, we've just been doing pretty much that. This because sometimes that was really terrible, but yeah, hammer, shot put, tried everything, tried everything. and I actually competed in everything. So um, high jump, long jump, name it. So that's why Maria is such a good discus thrower as well. <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, now we're actually doing something, but I, I like this because, and it actually it's a really funny story, but. Last year, well, t two years ago, right? We, you know, after my elbow surgery, everything, I really couldn't throw javelin, so I was depressed. I was very sad, uh, and coach was like, "Why just don't try this? Cause it really doesn't hurt your elbow, and it's a different movement and stuff." So I threw like forty-five with very very little training and uh technique so um then i had shoulder surgery so we, and then this year actually we started throwing once a week um discus and it's been really it's going really well yeah. we threw uh, 47 meters the other day with no reverse so uh well we're, we're excited to see how far you can go it's my fun event i i really liked it um because it doesn't hurt so track and field in general is a worldwide sport right like you talk about tennis you really have to be in position to afford Rackets, coaches, uh, time on the court, travel, it's incredibly, incredibly expensive. And our area, where we come from, we are very good in track and swimming and handball, soccer, these sports are not, uh, or in, in tennis. I mean, uh, uh, Noak, unbelievable, right? We had Ivanisha, we had uh, this, uh, Ivana, what was the name? Ivana, um, two girls that were winning. It's, it's really a very athletic area. And it's a, uh, great that you have these coaches who do look for talents and give you opportunity to throw or do any sport that is a low let's say low cost uh, entrance right so they can propel you to something more right? if you're if you're traveling you get exposed and i remember this uh, uh <clears throat> my first meet in italy my tra first meet outside of croatia and you come to this country, everybody's speaking different languages. Like it's 100 kilometers away. It's not like across the world. And you just pass this border and everybody's dressed differently. Everybody speaks differently. And your mind, as you're 14 and 50, I was 15 years old at the time, you get this new percep perception of the world. And you come back with, with different lens, right? And it gives you opportunity to learn to not be in a box. Because uh, being in a box is very dangerous. So we can see this in the world if you watch news. Uh, you appreciate other cultures, other people. You understand their troubles and their their you know, their their desires, their goals. Right at the end of the day, everybody wants to be happy. Uh, everybody wants their kids to do well, right? To be respected. And when you understand that, uh, it's it's totally totally different uh, world uh, perspective that that you get. And sports gets you to that right away. The travel, 
uh, meeting different, even from, I remember, a different city, right? We went to, uh, in the area that we live, there's a lot of accents, right? Even you know, a couple of kilometers you go, you can tell, oh, he's not from this area, he's from that area. Even if it's the same country, within like 60 miles, you can you know hear. So just traveling to different places, uh, it opens up a lot. So um, good thing that you had a coach that uh, recruited you. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was... It's such a small town, so we kind of knew each other. I mean, we all know each other pretty much. Like, it's it's by this point. Um, but it is amazing how far you can get by just meeting new people. As you said, like, meeting new culture. Um, you know, I was, I was shocked when I, you know, we traveled to World Championship. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, and I was really young and I was scared and stuff. But it opened, like, my, like, yeah, lenses to the to people who don't look like me, who don't speak like me you know and i get that as i got to us it was like that i felt like maybe some people felt like that back in the days um that you know maybe i don't speak good english and how would they people think of me if they don't understand what i'm saying or if i have a i have a different opinion you know like yeah. would you appreciate what i say or you just like this discharge whatever i said you know and you and you feel that and you accumulate all these well, all these things that actually you say and you see like throughout your career and that makes you feel bad and makes you feel good about something. So appreciating what you have and appreciating other people and their struggles. We all have struggles, I would say, like not, I mean, just at least, right? So keep that in mind and bear that um, we are all different and we all have each, like unique view on each other thing, so... Yeah. With track and field, you get so many uh, in U.S. especially, right? You study here. You're on a team with your teammates are from literally all over the world, right? You get all these perspectives from different areas of the world. You get friends forever, right, for a long time that are from different uh, parts of the world. And it's a really unique situation, a uh, really, ne really neat situation to live in, right? So I encourage definitely all the kids back home, my nephews now, uh, I you trick them kind of like let's go you know, let's go with the uncle well, let's play some track and field right so I'm like no no the left foot over here I'm trying to get them to throw to experience that not to not to change them in what they want to do in life but to make sure you do get to understand other people not just opinions uh, religions beliefs uh, but to understand why people are doing something that they do what what motivates them. Uh, not just to cut people off because it's a I find this I love meeting new people and talking to them about their culture their experiences where they're coming from uh, it, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's amazing it's a, a lot of joy uh, when I first came to US I'm sure you experienced this so many different cultures right like at home you have you know Montenegro that was it Croatia that's it right Serbia you come here it's like whoa it's like a buffet <laughs> yeah. It's actually funny, but um, so when I got to Kennesaw and um, English was scary and I actually heard a lot of people speaking Spanish and I was like, this is amazing. I want to do that. I want to speak like that. And um, that kind of brought me to me taking Spanish classes rather than English classes. I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, I loved it. I've never spoken Spanish before in my life. I've never, I never thought like, of, like you know, studying Spanish. And I just took a couple of classes, and I mean, it was amazing. And I majored in Spanish here, UVA, and then global, global studies. How but many do you speak? five. Five. Yeah. Which are um, but th those languages kind of progress throughout my um, time here for the five years I've been here. So, you know, English, of course, but um, of course, I mean, I, I kind of like I, I speak it, but I still don't know it. Right. Uh, but um, I mean, Spanish, I kind of speak Spanish better than English, which kind of brought me back to me. Major in Spanish, right? Yes, yeah, so I majored in Spanish and I, I, I yeah, and I took even more classes than I, I needed because I, I loved it and that exposure to, to the Spanish culture and Latin America and everything. But I took French. I mean, I speak Russian since like I was eight. Um, that's another thing that we do back home. We do first Russian and then our language. 
So, I mean, how many is that? I don't even know. Like, uh, and I'm, I'm learning Arabic right now. <laughs> it's tough. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I, I do have help, but it is tricky. It's the far, like, it's farthest, the, hard, the, the hardest language I've ever, I've ever encountered because, uh, you know, it's, it's alphabet and, and reading and everything. Um, so I'm, I'm really working hard. I'm trying hard with all the things I have to work on the side and, and, learn um, because I'm also fascinated by the Middle Eastern culture and I love I love everything that so I read on this when I'm meditating I read about that um, so that's also something that fascinates me and when I was in Spain for a month on um, study abroad yeah. that was also a great experience and I would recommend everyone um, who can to to get a chance to I mean if you come to UVA you have to take a study abroad um, one year so I think that they did this this year, I think. So that's amazing opportunity. That's amazing chance to actually get out of the box, right? How was that? So you spent first. You took Spanish here because obviously uh, you were exposed to it around you. Uh, you got you got to like it, and then you got to live basically a month or two months in Spain. How was that experience? So I was in Valencia, and I was in a host family. And they were amazing. Yeah. I mean, I was in the middle of Valencia, and it's a it's a gorgeous. And I was in Montenegro. That I flew from I flew from here to Montenegro. I was there for three weeks with my family, and then I just flew to to Barcelona and then to Valencia, and I stayed there for more than four four weeks. Right. I mean, they cooked their food. They prepared me whatever I wanted. I ate so much. And I mean, as you know, right, but we got like, we were in a really good position in the city where our university was literally like five minute walk. So we didn't have to take a metro or bus or anything from, from my host family. So each like, you know, all I knew a lot of athletes who were going there as well. So um, they were stationed somewhere else, like far away. So we were, I was lucky. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we would just take a metro like 10 minutes and we were like shopping centers like we were in the middle like we were like you know the churches the, like I mean it was incredible um we would just walk everywhere we got lost so many times uh which is also a good idea because I mean during the day, during the day yeah no don't go to that yeah you have your phone and you know, it, it's really it's a good way, yeah. So explore the city. the city, yeah. So exploring the city, taking so many pictures, like speaking with people, actually going to the grocery store and asking for something in Spanish, yeah. and they are giving you that, and that That's means you that means you you got yeah you got that right. That was like wow, they understand me, like yeah. you know, completely different, completely different exposure from class yeah. from classroom yeah. standpoint to actually speaking with people natives right yeah. um you know it's di different accents different I, I have professors from cuba from uh peru from mexico from i mean all these countries from different accents and i come to one classroom like okay and then other yeah. classroom so in spain is definitely another thing which i had to and i'm like practicing um how to pronounce things definitely something that it's I, I mean i'm so grateful for the opportunity yeah that's incredible i encourage all uh, all of my athletes all of our athletes that we have at uva to find a good study abroad program um, uva we're fortunate to have uh, many different opportunities different places that, that people can go it's like you said one thing to learn in class it's totally a different thing to learn it with the host family too, I can't even imagine that. So you live with them, you talk to them. Yeah, so you are actually not allowed to speak English. English, English. Awesome. yeah. And my, my host my host mom, she didn't even know English. And it doesn't matter what I say to her. Sometimes I was like, potato, tomato, I mean, what, like, you know, and then I would eventually have to say right. Spanish. Yes. And that was so, I mean, the, the host dad, he spoke a very, very good English, but he was, he would, he would be like, okay, like, you know, let's, let's speak English for like two minutes and that's it, okay. you know? So yes. Yeah. 
so every you know every night we had a dinner and we would speak very well on topic about you know what do we do in that day what do we have for tomorrow um they ask us many questions and you have to i mean if you're as as in us you're also forced to learn um language so I, when i first came uh, to us <clears throat> the opportunity we talked about this training back home and to going to college is almost impossible right you have to go to a different town maybe different parts of the town for different lectures and then when do you find time to practice right um, but not just that in us so that's all in one place you take a bus you go to training and then you get to your classes everything is set up right you can do so much more so much more in us academically and at- athletically because of the proximity and because of the professors who are actually friendly and willing to teach you extra if you need to right go, come to office hours there is no when i when i go back when i was you know 15 16 17 you have this perception about international right you know, about something foreign that is bad or is it or it's unaccessible uh and not worthy right not worthy in just trouble i and i don't know how you feel but i if i didn't leave Croatia, I would. Ne- I, I don't know what kind of person I would be, what kind of perspective I would have of the world. You know, you're speaking five languages now. I'm struggling with two, uh, but you know, that's still more than than, uh, uh, than the minimum that you would have back home. Do you? How do you feel that? Well, obviously, would you do it again if you had, you know, in a position to do, to go to US? Oh yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even. Th- I wasn't even thinking back then, and I knew I want something. I want, yeah, I want, I wanted to be recognized for something that it's not just going to, like everyone else. I am extra step. step. And I, you know, I always encourage people, take it even further. Like, don't be as ordinary as, right, everybody else, I agree. But in the same time, you are special. Every, each one of us, you, and you get the chance to do this once in your lifetime. And as you coach right or myself or my colleagues here my teammates if we didn't take that step who knows who knows what would happen with us where would be probably like finish college or university back home find a job um, be ordinary citizens right um full-time job uh pay taxes um maybe found a family like you know or um what everybody else do right so i always think that even i joke i make the jokes here that you know, us athletes and then these regular people. <laughs> uh, it's really funny, but uh, students, regular students. like regular students, because I don't think as myself as regular or I don't think myself as, oh, I'm just an ordinary. Um, I think everyone, even whoever is listening or watching this, um, has something special within ourselves. And that something special will come out eventually, right? Even if that's in 16 uh, years old or like 18 or 20, something will eventually come up. I would definitely do it again. I mean, I will, I changed so much. You know, I, maybe people who are watching this and know me a couple of years ago. I mean, it's just it's crazy. But I think that comes with time, right? I think that with ages, you get to do these things, and then with certain ages, you get to do other things. But eventually, like this is one you get one chance. Sometimes, maybe two if you're really lucky. <laughs> but use it. Like, don't think, of, don't think too much, I, as I would be thinking back, back in the days, maybe you too, like, but how, what, like, when, like, yeah. all these questions that you don't have answer to, don't, don't try too hard, right? Because life will itself figure it out, hopefully. Yeah, no, like I said before, I'm very happy that you did make the step, that you eventually came here. That you're part of the team, Maria. Really, your your influence or, or on your friends, on your athletes, on your teammates is incredible. Nobody stands there uh, with their you know arms crossed when you're working out. You're going full hundred percent, right? And then you will influence and motivate people around you. So, thank you for making the steps. And I can't even imagine for me being a, a guy. It's one thing to go abroad. For being a woman, a young woman. That's a, that's an extra extra uh, courage that you need to take, but you did all the necessary steps to make sure those that step is the right one and safe, right? You contacted all the coaches, 
you make sure you do your research you make sure to talk to your friends who already been there uh, so when you do all these things uh, it's, you, you should never just jump into something and hope it's going to work out right uh, do your research be diligent about that uh, about university about coaches about the process visa how do you what do you need to do to get there is it worth it and then you put it on paper and if it's you know safe as it is uh, to go to to US if it's it, does it pay off yes and then you can make the step but uh, it's it's still you know when you put it on paper and you do make the calculation it's still it's not easy right i mean don't even try to put it on paper i think it's always like going to never going to be a win for you considering all the sacrifice that it's actually you know you see it like no like this is not this is not good you know and your family your friends everybody is influencing and pushing you to do things that you might not want to do right or maybe your heart does not lead you to that so i think always listen to your heart and always listen to you know your gut i i have i have like hundreds of you know like there's a messages on instagram asking me oh my gosh like how how do you do this and you're such an inspiration and and i i'm so happy and i if if i inspire one person in this world i'm that's i'm done right like you know i i did a lot and i am so proud of myself for everything but also proud of those people who are actually doing extra step messaging me that's not an easy thing like i don't know but people are scared to message me i don't know why the don't be but i don't reply sometimes but it's like don't be you know i i always think like ask, ask. ask. Well, um ask, yeah. whoever Keep yeah, whoever messaged me with a really like nice message saying, "Oh my gosh, like how do you do this?" or asking for advice or you know, asking for coach advice or something like I'll be more than happy to help because I wish I did that. You know, back in the days uh, um where I would be like I need someone to help me and who knows better than person who will be in my position, right? So don't be afraid to ask um and to research and each one of us would help so uh, like you said uh, you know if you have one person you you helped you know your mission was accom- accomplished right we don't usually realize that other people look up to us and they, our parents or our siblings or our friends they can benefit so much from us uh, or you know they can uh, they can get a wrong perspective about things if we fail to do them right um so we mo- we color the world with uh, uh with people uh, uh, to people around us as well right you are who you are with so if you're not trying to live to your best to be the best version of yourself somebody looking at you like oh why would i try see maria she failed like uh, why would i try right <clears throat> or or she said it's not worth it you know to see you no know, why would i try i'll just stay home and yes. do nothing don't work right so they can find excuse or you know they can find wrong motivation in you um so we we all all the time we fail to realize that that other people are looking at us our friends our family you know our parents uh and we owe it to them to be the best person uh, that we can be well, how was your your parents when you were, you told them uh, you want to go and your sister you're very close to your sister uh, you just became an aunt congratulations what's the what's his name matia so it's one letter difference than maria so it's oh, yeah so true. yeah that's up to me so matia if you're watching this in 20 years from now <laughs> we're talking about you oh. it's hard i don't think it's easy for um i don't think it's easy for any parent to just let their child go into the unknown and especially if they cannot, cannot control that and i mean i don't know you you know how is the culture back home you but at least stay to live with your parents when you're 28 29 like until you get married or like you know um, or further right <laughs> just to build yeah another floor so here it's different like you're 18 and you're good to go into the world and they expect you to know all the things that you know but back home it's differently they they try to um not let you go like even is if you, even if you want to they don't let you go so when i was thinking about this move and um you know my mom was the biggest support for me and i don't think that you really are ready for this step if you don't have their support it's really hard to you know there there is another stress on your you know on yourself when you're like i have to leave them and i really don't want to leave them because they're all that i have 
and I'm not gonna have them there to do whatever like or help me so you know all of them they were really supportive I mean even though I could see they're not um, they really tried to hide it from me my mom she paid for me for all SATs that I took gosh that was expensive and and Toho and, and traveling back to other cities to take that application fees forms I mean there's just a million like forms you have to fill in and it's it's hard it's really uh, financially it's really hard um for person to deal with that crisis that i mean some people they don't have and you cannot ask for that right um so I'm, i was really really lucky and fortunate to have that support because you know i wasn't working where would i get that money from right and if you don't have that that it's really it's really hard you i mean it's it's an obstacle so even now they're always like you got like you know after all these surgeries and after like i haven't seen them for a year and a half you know i haven't my sister was pregnant the whole time i, I wasn't there she got like so uh you know I, I finally got to go home and uh and see the baby and i'm like oh my god like it's a baby like um so i mean it was just amazing experience for me because i was here the whole time and I kind of like distance myself from them because that's what you got to do if you really if you really want to stay if you really have to stay here it's hard like there was a mental breakdowns where I would be like I need to go home I miss them so much even you are in US people are you know away yeah they're homesick and they're 100 miles but they're homesick imagine yeah. 6000 miles so it's not like I can just go for a weekend and stay with them um but i was i'm really close to my family and actually they are one of the re biggest reasons I, I i got where i am right now so i think that family support is yeah. a, a leading cause to this so yeah no i, I remember same way my mother right uh, she was very supportive and well helped me a lot uh, she couldn't speak english right she speaks russian like most of our parents do as a second language, right? But she said, oh, son, if you did your research and you think it's a good idea, I support you. I know that you're going to make a good decision. Um, and then when I, you know, when I left, it's like, like you said, it's really hard to just leave like that, right? So you have to, you don't break connection with them. You know, you try to Skype, you try to call and, you know, come back for summer when you do get the chance. It's, it's amazing, right? You pick up where you were. You get to see your parents get older. Right? So these, these things are part of life, you know, just for for somebody international, U.S. too, right? You, you're going through this stage, and you see how much, and you appreciate over time, you appreciate more and more the support of your parents that they had, right? It's it's so it's so important, and this is also for coaches and, and, and parents who listen. That means a lot to a kid when you're supportive. You can be concerned, but you. What, what sometimes parents do, I see this with my athletes, um, they are very negative uh, with some things because of their fear, right? Like, oh, that coach or that school is terrible. Why would you go to this school? Like, oh, well, you know, they they cut you right away. You know, you're stupid to think of that or something like that. It hurts uh, a lot to, to, to a kid like that, and it can make detrimental effects uh, for a long life. So it's really good that you had supportive parents and family yeah i mean i, I was I, I know that most people do have and I'm, I'm maybe you know i'm happy about it but i do urge to um to be even more and through all you know you don't have to be supportive by just saying i, I support your decision and um, you go to college and that's it like it's so it's even more important to actually support them throughout their career or college something that is uncertain but it's it's necessary for 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 you to become better, right? Yeah. So you know, I did my decision to to, to continue my grad school. So, yeah, I even took my grad school and another year, and another, was, another yeah. year, and, you know. And I actually want to do my PhD, and I mean that's just crazy. And they were like, "What? How long are you gonna study for?" I'm like, "Forever," I would say. Like, but I, I love that. I that makes me happy, and um, I enjoy in that, right? But then I also enjoy in throwing. I also enjoy in athletics, and I, you know, I, I hope to get to go pro and to go um, to some other waters that I, you know, I, I I want to go right to find a coach yeah. or to go back to Europe and and start my professional career finally when I'm healthy and um, 
throw as much as I can or throw as 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 far as far as I can um, and get that limit. Like I don't want to be just limited to my college career. Um, I don't know if this is a topic or yeah, there's a question. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's really hard to you know be. You know, you get. The sp- I, I know in U.S. it's really hard to get sponsored and um, to continue the professional career. But I would say that this is. I feel that this is not an end for me. And in some people, uh, especially after so many injuries and after so many, I don't know, not failures, but like disappointments. I felt like that sometimes that I don't want to do this anymore and this is I don't know what I'm doing to myself and why is life like that? there's all these questions that comes uh, with with that um, but if you don't push that if you don't push for more and, and you don't break that limit um, as for me right now I, I'm gonna be I'm gonna regret it this for the rest of my life um, and come come back maybe the same thing right now is I if I didn't go to US yeah. you know or something so I really want to try. I really want to see how everything goes, you know, without school, which will be a different experience and see how can I improve myself, my body and my everything. So I talked about, I talked with one of my athletes, former athletes, now volunteer assistant, your former teammate, Bridget, the other day, right? Uh, She's taking a year off to get ready for trials to see if she can make Olympics. And I talked this uh, with so many throwers, uh, guys and girls, right? Your peak in throwing does not come until you're 20, uh, in my opinion, right? Uh, when you look at the stats, 27, 28, 29, 30, 30. How old is Shputakova? She's 37, 38. She's close to 40, right? She went to SMU a long time ago, right? Sorry, Shputakova, I'm <laughs> throwing some uh, numbers here that you, uh, that you don't want people to know. But yeah, she she went to SMU a long time ago, right? She's still throwing. She's almost four years old. She has two kids. And when did yes? And when did she throw a world record? She was past thirty, right? Uh, so it's the same way with the guys. Uh, you see, get contact, right? Those guys. There was I remember Zvereva, two thousand eight Olympics. This is a grandmother. She has a daughter who has a daughter. She's forty seven in Beijing finals in discus. She's throwing over sixty one meters. Uh, you're really your limits of your throwing. They come with strength, right? Obviously, Spotakova is throwing really far at, at uh, age. They're double as some of her competitors, right? Like uh, like uh, Sara Kolak, right? So you have so much time to get better, especially for somebody like you who hasn't really thrown uh, for more than two years. Right? This is your second year of throwing healthy. Now, we can watch throwing. You, you don't get better in throwing unless you throw. Right? You can do bench press. You can do watch videos. You cannot get better, but throwing, right? Um, so I really do hope you'd continue and you find a way and we'll try to make uh, whatever we can. You're always welcome to train here, um, to come back for a training camp. Obviously, it will be the best if your federation can sponsor or you can find a sponsor. Uh, but th- don't stop throwing if you can. Because um, when you're 30, 35, you cannot be like, oh my God, you know, let me try make Olympics again. Now is the time. You have all your life to do what you want to do, sitting behind a desk or, you know, traveling the world, whatever you want to do. You can make Olympics and get better when you're physically capable, right? So that's next 10 years. Um, So anybody um, who's thinking about it's really hard for students after college because you don't have those resources, right? You have to find a job. You have to find a sponsor. It's incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard. Um, but I hope, you know, you find a way and you'll see, you know, a lot of athletes and you already work and go to school and go to practice. Right. Uh, so I'm sure you can find, you will find a way if it's not first year, don't stop for the next five years. Right. Uh, I think the next Olympics. And then if you, you know, you can say that you've done everything that you could, um, then stop. But, uh, 30, uh, 30 is nothing in throwing 35 after 35. Then, you know, if you're not Spotako throwing 70 meters already or get contact who threw 73, and then after that, I will say it goes down. But it's all, it's all way up until 32. So, and if you have kids, right, um, it could be a great thing. She has two kids, you say. Yeah, so it's manageable. It's hard. I'm um, okay, yeah. Yeah, Tina Rate, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> With having kids for what? I'm good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, as, I, as you said, I'm working now and I'm in the office and, 
you know, I have this great office and, you know, I'm, I'm doing uh, desktop work and I'm like, I cannot wait to go to practice. I cannot wait to get up here and, and do what I love. And I cannot imagine myself eight hours a day, every day doing that and just drowning into the work and paperwork and stuff. So if you really have passion for this, if you really like what you do, as Bridget, right? Like I, you know, every possible way I would encourage and, you know, as, as I would, I'm going to write, um, do my best to find a good, um, coach and, and good teammates and, um, yes. And, um, do my best. Cause I cannot imagine how it's to train without having to write like 15 page paper, you know, and prepare one hour and a half debate, um, or like do anything, right? Like five hours a day in school. This is like too much, right? It's so, you know, you have twice a day training, you rest, rehab, you rest, like you sleep, um, you take care of your body. The result has to come um, eventually. I'm sorry, I'm excited. So we'll see. I'm excited for you too. It's like I say, it's a hard thing, but it's doable. If eventually, if it's if you do have find a position, if you do find a job, you can find an hour and a half, two hours a day. If you can't find for yourself, you don't have a life, right? So those two hours. You, what are you doing that you can't have two hours out of, you know, 16 hours a day that you are awake? Maybe for you it's 15 or 14 if you sleep a little longer. Uh, but you can find two hours, right? You want, There's no job that's going to require you and that you should work at unless it's your own company. You're starting something amazing more than eight, nine hours a day, right? So, um, so yeah, Maria, your next couple of meets, Texas, you're opening up. Um after that, if everything goes well, yeah, Texas, we have a couple of home meets. What are your uh, thoughts before you go into those meets? I'm so excited. I mean, I I don't know if you can see that <laughs> or hear that. Really excited. Uh, finally, I'm I'm going into something that I really believe is going to be great. And I don't expect a lot from the first or second meet, um, simply because I put myself to be. Uh, ready in June or you know end of May um, for the meets that really matter for for us for the UVA team. Um, but for myself, I I just want to continue what I'm doing right now. Um, we we are still continue to throw um, twice a week, and um, I mean I'm strong. I want to become faster, uh, more explosive, and everything that comes throughout the season. You know, I'm so excited to go to Texas. And, and throw there um, and then home meet it's always good to compete here um, so please come and join us I'm watching <laughs> and cheering and um, and then for ACC and regionals I hope to be in, in you know in, in, in best shape and um, throw my PR so I, if everything goes well so I'm really excited and yeah I can do it <laughs> well again Maria thank you so much for Choosing UVA, thank you for being part of this team. I had an incredible, I'm incredibly fortunate to work with you for the last four years. It's going to be impossible to replace you. You're unique, like you, everybody is. Uh, you brought so much to us, so much value to your teammates, to me. I learned a lot from you. Hopefully, you learned anything from me, right? Something at least. Uh, and I hope uh, I really, I'm really excited about this season. It's going to be incredible. Maria is in gr best shape in her life, technically, physically. Mentally, obviously, you see you have everything uh, together, right? Uh, this is going to be the year, and it's going to be really exciting. So, yeah. Thank uh, you. We'll talk more after after the season as well. Yeah. Right. That would be a great thing Thank to do. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>